So hello, everyone. Welcome to this online workshop on anonymizing qualitative and quantitative data. My name is Maureen Hicker. I am a lecturer at University of Suffolk, and I also work with the UK Data Service on a whole range of, of projects. So I've done everything from like digitization uh, to reuse projects. And I'm here with my colleague, Anka. Did you want to introduce yourself? <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Anka, and I work at the UK Data Service as well. Um, my focus is uh, on quantitative data, and I also um, work at a cancer, not a cancer research, at cancer research UK, uh, where I manage their um, um, secure data environment. So, if you've heard of uh, the, I don't know, the ONSSRS, that's the equivalent of. Um, yeah, what we're doing at CRUK as well, um, and at UKDS, so we have the Secure Lab as well, so we mostly, um, yeah, I mostly look at, at quant data, um, so we have both quant and qual here represented today. <laughs> so back to you, Maureen. We're going to begin by talking, so I think we, we aim to talk for around 45 minutes to an hour, and then there's a couple exercises as well to help you get started thinking about anonymization in your own work. Um, Anka and I will be monitoring the questions throughout the webinar to try and answer as many as possible as we go along, but we should also have some time hopefully at the end uh, to talk through any of the frequently asked questions. Um, this is an overview of what we're planning on doing today, so we'll give you a bit of background on anonymization, why it's important, what the theoretical underpinning is, what are your legal responsibilities, We'll then go into a short um, exercise later on using Mentimeter, for those of you who are familiar with it, and um, hopefully give you a bit of a practical overview on um, anonymization and what some of the tips are for quant and qual data specifically. Um, okay, and then we'll, we'll uh, give you some further resources at the end, um, so a bit of signposting so you can continue your um, exploration of anonymization. Okay, so we'll, we'll get started on a brief overview of what anonymization theory is. So the UK Anonymization Network has published an openly available anonymization decision-making framework. Um, and the National Center for Research Methods has posted extensive tutorials on this. So I didn't want to go into too much detail here, but I thought this framework would be a really good place to start talking about anonymization. So the framework starts with the basic idea that anonymization, um, you know, is it's not just a single process that's done at any one point in time. And instead, it kind of outlines these three key aspects of decisions that you make on how to anonymize. And the first of these is to think about the data situation audit, which is specifically considering where do you want to present the data? What is your role and responsibility with that data? And what are the specifics of that data? So what variables have been collected? Uh, where are they stored? The next stage is to actually do a risk analysis. What are the actual chances of there being a disclosure? Um, and, and just to say, you know, a disclosure is, is basically where um, you are able to connect a specific detail to a specific person, right? So that's what we mean by disclosure. And the final stage is impact management. So if there is a disclosure, what are the plans for what happens then? So there's just a couple of points I think to make here. This framework comprehensively points out that analyzing the, the risk of disclosure should be iterative. It's not linear. There's no single point where this should be assessed, but rather you should think about all the places that data are stored or presented. The risk for publishing with data extracts for example, should be considered along with sharing data with colleagues across institutions or storing data on a computer. The other point I want to um, uh, reiterate here is that it, it's not possible to, quote unquote, fully anonymize data. I think um, guidance from the ICO within the UK currently talks about effective anonymization or effectively anonymous. Um, but fully anonymizing would mean that even a participant themselves looking at the data would not be able to identify their own answers. And stripping data down to this point reduces the value for analysis. 
So to avoid depleting the, the value of data, even comprehensive anonymization would still have to leave at least some, albeit theoretical, space for re-identification. The idea is to balance the risk of disclosure. What is the the probability of re-identifying uh, to a point where disclosure can be mitigated and it can be dealt with. So fully anonymized or guaranteeing confidentiality, um, I, I would say isn't really possible, possibly not even desirable, as it suggests stripping data down to something that is actually rather worthless. Um, so what we're going to go through today, hopefully, will give you a few tools to kind of think about uh, what choices you might make in this process of anonymization. So um, Anka, did you want to uh, expand a little bit more here on disclosure? Thank you, Maureen. Sorry, I was muted. Make sure I can hear me. Okay, so um, thank you, Maureen. Um, so as Maureen has um, given us already a big picture, um, but um, I think it's important to take a few steps back and make sure that we understand um, <clears throat> Um, you know, all the concepts involved and uh, we don't just uh, throw in <laughs> terms like disclosure and anonymization and, uh, you know, without uh, making sure we understand what, what, what we're referring to. Okay, so um, what is disclosure and why do we need anonymization? So first off, we have we have disclosure, right? I'm sure you've heard about, uh, about it before, but when talking about anonymization, disclosure simply means um, identification. So when someone is able to identify a data subject from data or information they have access to, be it from one or multiple sources. Um, there are a few types of disclosure, um, the difference being in the type of information we learn about that um, unit of observation. Um, notice I say unit of observation, so it might be a person or it might not, of course, depending on the data. It might be a company, it might be a household, a shop on High Street, etc. So depending on what information we learn about that unit of information, that's what makes the difference in the type of disclosure we, we are talking about. Um, so, I mean, this is also implied by the name. So we have attribute, uh, we have identity, and we have inferential disclosure. Briefly, identity disclosure occurs when it's possible to associate a known individual with the release data record. Um, okay, um, attribute disclosure occurs when it's possible to determine um, some new characteristics of an individual based on the information available in the release data. And inferential disclosure um, occurs when it's possible to determine the value of some um, characteristics of an individual more accurately with the release data than um, would otherwise um, have been possible without that release data. Okay, so now um, this is slightly beyond the purposes of this workshop, but this is something, um, you know, if you're interested in um, the different types of disclosure, um, <clears throat> we have, there are multiple sources of information where you can learn more about this, and we linked some of these at the end of this presentation if you'd like to read further. Um, for the purposes of today's workshop, we will just refer to disclosure in general without making um, any distinctions. So just to say that, it's important. Okay, so now that we know what um, disclosure is, um, anonymization is simply a process by which we try to prevent disclosure, right? Um, and as I'm sure you know, there are multiple levels to, to this game to say so. So for a data set to be, as Maureen already mentioned, to be truly anonymous, um, you know, its value for research would be, um, you know, arguably very low, if any. Um, that is why we have different levels uh, of anonymization, as we're going to see further in this presentation as well, one of which is pseudonymization, um, and we will look in future slides uh, a bit more at pseudonymization as well. For now, it's important to mention that um, both anonymization and pseudonymization are, are part of um, SDC, or Statistical Disclosure Control. Um, as the name implies, SDC aims to minimize or mitigate the risk of identification to, um, to an acceptable level that will still allow researchers to, to maximize data use. 
Um, <clears throat> so from <laughs> as the last point of this slide, which is probably one of the most important aspects to remember, especially if you're preparing to um, or planning to share data for um, for reuse, uh, when uh, disclosure risk um, you know goes down, so the more we reduce that disclosure risk, the more we anonymize, the more information we lose from that data. Okay. We mentioned both anonymization and pseudonymization, and for the sake of clarification, we wanted to include some definitions here for you. I'll, I'll, I will read them out as you can see them on the screen, and of course, um, you will have the slides, but it's important to remember that um, from a data set, which is, um, which is classified as anonymized, uh, we will not be able to re-identify data subjects, right? So not even the data owner. So if I, if I collected, say, a particular data set after anonymization, I would not be able to re-identify anyone um, or be able to point out an observation and think, okay, I think that is X or that is Y. Um, also, if I was a research participant who agreed to having my data collected for a study and I looked at a, non a fully anonymized version, right, so that's fully anonymized version, I would not be able to tell who is me, right? Um, so that is what we mean when we refer to fully to fully anonymized data, um, you know, disclosure risk is extremely low or zero. Okay. Um, now moving on to pseudonymized, this is data that is that is not anonymized. <laughs> okay. This is data that uh, still contains more or less some details that would um, that could and would potentially, especially perhaps combined with other sources of information, um, allow re-identification. So disclosure risk is present um, with in, in pseudonymized data to varying degrees depending on the level of pseudonymization, and we'll see that there are different there are different levels as well to, to pseudonymization, um, also depending on, for example, what access level we're going to place that data under, but we'll see that that later on. Um, okay, so now someone might ask why would ever why would we ever want to have pseudonymized data then? Um, and of course we need to think back of the previous slide because the more disclosure risk goes down, so approach is zero, the more information we lose, so therefore our analysis will not be um, possible or uh, you know if possible will not be very valuable. So we'll we'll keep looking at this um, some more in future slides. Um, okay, so a few more sources here to mention, uh, as I think they're important to flag. So um, we're talking about identification and anonymization. So the Data Protection Act does not prohibit the disclosure of personal data, uh, but any disclosure needs to be fair, lawful, and in compliance with data protection principles. So there are, of course, um, situations where disclosing certain information is absolutely fine, even personal data, for example, in cases where um, research participants do want their <laughs> data to be attributed to them. Um, and there are multiple factors um, or aspects we might want to consider uh, or that might apply depending on our projects and data we collect. So we need to think about how is our data going to age, right? So here at UKDA, we do archive data for the long term. Um, and you know we hold data which has been collected decades ago. Um, so to consider here our retention policies of applicable um, access restrictions, embargoes, for example, we have cases where data um, had to be embargoed for the first year after publication of the first five years, for example. Um, second here are the reason why um, it is and the reason why it's in bold here is because this is the aspect we're mostly focusing on when talking about anonymization. Um, so the level of detail in the data, the degree to which the data has been redacted, pseudonymized, um, etc. So, yeah, then we have context, and this is something that we need to consider when putting together um, our anonymization plan. Um, certain aspects of our lives are, of course, more public than others, and therefore would not necessarily need to, we wouldn't necessarily need to address them when, when anonymizing, when thinking about anonymization. Um, a general rule of thumb for data creators in general is to think about uh, the effect of potential disclosure on the research participants that are involved. Um, and finally, here is important to mention the role of data environments. So to illustrate this, um, we can think of a data set or data collection, be it qualitative or quantitative, um, that is available both in an archive um, and openly online. So let's say on a researcher's website. So we have the same data, but available in two separate environments. One is that is one that is secure, and one that is not. <laughs> 
um, a data archive or an accredited repository would have several safeguards in place to manage any disclosure risk present in the data, um, such as access controls, um, terms and conditions of access, uh, which users would need to agree to via license agreements, you know, metrics to have a record of who accessed the data, um, and so on. So while the data available on a website would have none of these, uh, one of none of the above. So really, this is um, what data environments, what the, this whole data concept of, of uh, data environments refers to. Perhaps you'll also find the, the term functional anonymization out there. Okay. Uh, moving on to, and this is probably one of the most important slides in today's presentation, is just looking, thinking about um, different information that we might find in our data um, and in what category that falls. Um, it also says variables for, for quantitative data, but this applies to both quant and qual um, data. So first we have identifying variables and we have sensitive variables. Um, for identifying variables, um, we have two different categories. We have direct and indirect. Um, they're also referred to, indirect, they're also referred to as key identifiers in SDC. Um, but yeah, um, today we'll, we'll probably just refer to them mostly as indirect identifiers. So for direct identifiers, this is information that um, directly identifies data subjects. So this is, um, uh, we usually think of it as personal data, personal information, uh, and we have some examples here on the screen, um, social, ins social insurance number, um, name, address, um, national insurance number, IP address, uh, NHS number, etc. Then we have indirect identifiers. Um, so this is um, information that um, still refers to individuals, but is not specific to those individuals, right? So we have gender, we have age, uh, we have geography, um, occupation, income, um, but this is data that put together can potentially be linked to other source of data, such as the elector electoral register, and therefore lead to um, identification. And then we have, um, we have sensitive variables. So this is information that is often, um, or it is subject to legal or ethical concerns. Um, this would be examples here. We have criminal history, sexual preferences and behavior, political affiliation, um, religion, uh, medical records, um, income, uh, although that is not subject <laughs> to legal concerns. Um, that is more of a, an ethical concern. Um, and yeah, we can see <laughs> that one variable can be both identifying and sensitive. Uh, and a good example there is, is income. So sensitive variables can also lead to, um, well, can lead to secondary or attribute disclosure, even if identity disclosure is prevented. So what that means is that we, they can help us learn new information about uh, entire segments of the population. Um, I said we're not going to make the distinction between different types of disclosure more <laughs> very much today, um, but this is, uh, this is a key point to, to, to mention. And if you're interested in learning about this more, um, we have linked some, um, some references at the end of the presentation for you to, to, to learn more. Um, I also added here a link uh, called You're Not So Anonymous. Um, it's a very <laughs> interesting piece that you can read more, um, same about anonymization and what, um, you know, potential linkages can be made between different data sources to, to lead to identification. So I added that for you if you'd like to read in your in your spare time. Okay, so this is was just a classification of all the different types of information that we can we can find in data and we'd be concerned with if uh, in the process of anonymization we put it together uh, a data anonymization plan. Uh, and we are going to have examples and um, you know we're going to um, look at this further. Okay, moving on, um, we have, <laughs> I also think this slide is very important because it helps to put a few concepts in, in context and understand how they change together and affect each other. So on the first arrow at the top, we have a data spectrum, um, if, you, if you will, so different types of data with different types of um, levels of anonymization um, done to it. Okay, so from raw uh, or source data, the 
on the first arrow on the far left um, to the identified. Um, so this is data that has had personal information taken out or redacted. Then we have pseudonymized data, which is one step further from the identified data in the sense that there has been further redaction done to some of the indirect identifiers or all of them, um, all the way to completely anonymized data. So <clears throat> then we have data utility, so how valuable this is for research. Um, the more detailed in the data, the higher the utility. And then we have access controls applied by archives or repositories. Um, so, of course, the more detail present in the data, the stricter the access level that the data needs to be, um, that the data will be available under. And finally, we have information loss, which we've which already um, seen in a previous slide. Um, the more we move from, from left to right on that first arrow of data anonymization, the more information we lose. Okay, um, so I thought this would be this would be a good idea to put all on a, on all of these concepts on one slide and see how they affect each other. Okay, I think this is back to you, Maureen. Yes, it is. So, <clears throat> uh, on on the point you've just made about trying to to balance all of these, you know, information loss and utility and, and anonymization and access, it's probably worth. Uh, mentioning that researchers still fall under some uh, legal obligations to disclose. So within the UK specifically, researchers have a duty of confidentiality. However, the duty of confidentiality is not absolute and it's not protected by legal privilege in the way, same way that it might be for other professions. Specifically, researchers are still obliged to, for example, inform appropriate authorities where there is abuse of children or vulnerable adults, or where there are crimes committed that are covered under terrorism prevention legislation, and, uh, and um, that is the, the prevent, um, and that includes things like money laundering, for example. Um, so my own experience of this is, uh, for my PhD research, I went through the Health Research Authority for Ethical Approval, and specifically, they scrutinized the consent forms for clear statements, which clarified my limits of confidentiality. So this included thinking about the possibilities where raw data would be presented, such as publications, but also informing participants that I could actually break confidentiality, um, including all of that information into my information sheets, of course, meant that you know my information sheets and, and consent forms were quite comprehensive uh, in terms of what I what I had to actually discuss with participants so that they were fully informed. And you can see a sample of some of the text here from one of my information sheets. So I think the point that anonymization is a bit of an art and it's not absolute um, is one of the points that I, I hope you take away from this workshop. Okay, um, on the next slide. The other point that I wanted to make around uh, other aspects which can impact anonymization uh, that we talked about is, is access levels. So here um, is an outline of the different access levels that are used at the UK data service. Um, but you may need to think about who has access to the data. So when you share data, it doesn't mean it's just you know, necessarily openly available. Um, if you've shared it through the UK data service, most of the data is what we call safeguarded, which means that users need to sign our terms and conditions in order to reuse the data. And those terms and conditions stipulate things like, um, even in the unlikely event of re-identification, re-users will not share the identity of participants. Um, there are other levels as well, uh, which are more restricted, uh, including permission only access, where the depositor needs to approve a reuse of the data, or even controlled data, where you have to use the data within our controlled environment, and we then perform checks on the outputs to make sure there's no disclosures. Um, so there are different levels of access, even when you are sharing data through an archive, but even within your project, you know, you should also be thinking about the different places that you're sharing data and who has access to that and what kind of conditions there might be in order to grant access. Okay, uh, on the next page, it, it shows you uh, uh, 
a cover of one of our books. Um, there's more details about the access levels, legal obligations to disclose and anonymization in our managing and sharing research data book, which is published by SAGE. And the UK Data Service also publishes resources online. So there's lots of things that you can find. Um, and, and we have social media as well, where we'll tweet updates and, and other events of interest. But now we're going to move on to some of the practicalities of anonymizing. And qualitative data can be particularly tricky to anonymize. Um, the very nature of it means that it's full of indirect identifiers, particularly when you have rich biographical data. Um, so the tips that are listed here are much more focused on direct identifiers, you know, the kind of personal data we normally think of, but a full risk assessment should be done um, anytime that you're sharing the data, including excerpts of data. Uh, so when you're anonymizing qual data, you should, for example, um, anonymize at the time of transcription, unless you, you uh, need to link your data or you have explicit permission from your participants to use unanonymized data. Um, you should aim for some consistency across your data set. So consider uh, writing up an anonymization plan, and I'll show you an anonymization plan a little bit later on. Um, which kind of details the broader strategies that you're using to anonymize. Uh, you should identify any replacements that you do in the text. Um, so this is usually notated with brackets. Um, I have seen notations in other ways, like um, color coding, but normally when you see a transcript and there's some brackets in there, it normally means uh, that something has either been anonymized or edited within the transcript. You may also want to consider using an anonymization log, especially if you do not plan on keeping the original unanonymized data anywhere. If you ever do need to go back to check, the log would make sure that you have the original information somewhere. Um, within the archive, an unanonymized version is usually kept, but never released. So we kind of have this, I've heard it called like a shadow collection, but it's it's kind of this, we call it the no issue folder um, that has anything that might be unanonymized. So we, we keep raw data as well. Um, if you have appropriate security for that unanonymized data, it may be an option to keep that, um, but if not, consider an anonymization log. You should also avoid redacting. Um, so I've seen a lot of collections where it's it looks like one of those kind of comical, um, you, you know, Ministry of Justice kind of uh, redactions or something out of the Pentagon where they've just blacked out everything. Um, and it does render the data very difficult to reuse. It really minimizes any kind of value. Um, so use pseudonyms where possible to help keep the relationships uh, within the data uh, intact. And then um, the last point is avoid over-anonymizing. So, uh, uh, Anka will talk a little bit later about this as well, but think about aggregating variables like towns to larger areas like regions, or it may not be necessary to give, you know, for example, an entire date. Perhaps you can keep the month and year and just drop the actual day, and that's a way of aggregating to a larger level um, to help hide some of that uh, disclosive detail. One point we'll come back to uh, later is that it's uh, particularly for qualitative uh, data, it's better to control the access than it is to over-anonymize. So the detail within qualitative data is where the value of the data comes from. So it's really important to find the balance there and controlling who can see the data is a, is a better option than just getting rid of some of that detail. Okay, so on the next slide, we've got an example of where you can see that the name is replaced with the pseudonym, and that pseudonym would then be uh, used in place of, of Lucas throughout the entire text. The date and town have been aggregated to a larger level, and you can see once the interview starts, some of the biographical details are left in. Those are potential indirect identifiers, um, but they may be important to keep for the research itself. So instead of taking out those details, it's a better approach um, is shown actually on the next slide. 
which is where participants are informed about how the data will be used. So for example, the top text uh, for consent talks about using extracts of interviews and photographs and various outputs and how the interviews will be archived. And the example below is from a, a participant information sheet from one of my research projects, which says I'll use quotations and narrative themes and outputs, as well as who will have access to the data. Um, since my data went through ethical review uh, with the Health Research Authority for this project, that meant the NHS could run audits on my data. That's not an unusual kind of condition for ethical review. So it's worth checking whether or not ethics uh, panels are, are able to run those audits so that your participants are informed that that could be checked. Another way to protect participants is shown on the next slide, which is where you control access conditions. So the excerpt shown earlier of the anonymized interview where it had taken out and shown where pseudonyms would be replaced um, actually had quite specific access access conditions for the data. The collection combined interviews and diaries, and only some of those interviews were available to registered users uh, at the UK Data Service. There's another few that were embargoed, which means that they were kind of held back and inaccessible for a few years. Um, and then later they were released after some time had passed. Data can become less sensitive as time passes. So you may want to think about keeping it under embargo until a su sufficient time has passed that it could be released. Um, audio for this collection is also available, but it's under permission only access. So the original investigators have to approve any use of the audio before they can be released. So you can see the different types of data have different levels of potential disclosure. So consequently, there's different access conditions for that data. On the next slide, it shows a very different kind of example, which is our uh, collection Pioneers of Social Research. So Paul Thompson conducted oral history interviews with leading social scientists, and this included extensive details about their childhoods, their education backgrounds, their careers, and because of the, the relative fame of the participants, you know, these are leading sociologists, historians, anthropologists, they're well published and they're well known within their disciplines. So anonymization was a bit of a fruitless task um, and potentially even problematic um, for the collection and the research purposes. You needed to know who these people were basically in order to, to get something out of the data. So instead, Paul Thompson sought explicit permission from his participants to use their real names. Um, having said that, that doesn't mean that we didn't have a clear anonymization strategy in place. So when digitizing and reviewing the transcripts for this collection, we still looked out for issues where participants talked about the details of, for example, closed court cases, uh, medical conditions of others who were not involved in the study, or potential reputational damage. Um, so we still felt there were clear ethical boundaries to do some level of anonymization and editing, um, even though we had consent in place that basically covered our legal use of any of their personal data. Okay, the final example uh, that we've got here is on the um, next slide. And this is Jane Seymour's Managing Suffering at the End of Life. Um, so in this study, uh, Jane Seymour interviewed families and carers who had experienced a loved one going through long-term sedation as a palliative care measure to manage pain and anxiety at the end of life. So this was an ESRC funded project. Um, and there was, so there was a mandate to archive the data um, because of the data covering extensive sensitive personal data um, and, and this is, remember, a specific category under GDPR laws. So you not only have the direct and indirect identifiers, but also the sensitive data. Um, the consent for the use of that data had to be managed very carefully. So the UK Data Service worked with the Health Research Authority, who gave ethical approval for this project. 
to collect consent to share the data a few months after the death of uh, the individual. So it was deemed too difficult at the time to give informed consent about the long-term uh, preservation of the data. So instead, participants were given the opportunity to have some time away and then make a decision. Um, I did want to point out uh, this collection specifically because we often get queries about sensitive data, which is problematic to share. Um, and I wanted to point out that sensitive data does mean something very specific in legislation. Um, and often data, it, it sometimes isn't actually sensitive in that respect. So data protection laws uh, within the UK outline sensitive data as relating to a very specific set of characteristics. And that includes things like racial origins, sexual life, uh, political opinion, religious beliefs, trade union membership, um, and such like. So there's a specific list that they follow that is considered sensitive data. However, that doesn't mean that um, data that you collect that doesn't technically qualify as sensitive doesn't feel intimate to participants, right? So you can have a sensitive topic that isn't technically sensitive data. So even in cases though, where there is sensitive data, like, like this collection, it's still possible to anonymize and effectively and share the data when consent and access uh, to the data are also considered. Um, so I think this is a great example of where they've kind of used all of these strategies together um, to be able to uh, share the data onward um, and make full use of, of the data within their project. All right, I think it's back to you, Anka, now. <clears throat> Thank you, Maureen. Right, so we um, we mentioned quite a few times uh, an anonymization plan and different different levels of anonymization. Um, so now we're going to have a look at how to actually go about anonymization. How do we reach these uh, different um, different levels of anonymization? Um, so we have a few steps um, for to be uh, exact. Um, some of them will apply to both quantitative and qualitative data, such as the first step. So um, first we have to identify um, and remove or redact identifying information. Um, so those would be the direct identifiers. Of course, this is in line with what um, with what the participants have, uh, have agreed to. Um, so examples here, of course, this would be, this would potentially look different for, for quantitative and qualitative. Um, so for quantitative, if we have a column with names, we will just remove this completely, right? Um, if we have a column with uh, with address, we might just aggregate this to a city or to a country or, um, yeah. For qualitative data, it might be that we, we choose to replace names with pseudonyms rather than removing these altogether. Um, so, and finally, if we recall the slide with, with all the arrows on that we, we had a look earlier, um, the, the, the arrow at the top with the different uh, levels, uh, different types of data. So completing this step one would produce um, the identified data. Um, and we'll also point out where, where we've reached um, different levels of anonymization as well as we go through the steps. So this is um, this would result in the identified data. Moving on to step two. Um, so once we've completed step one, we need to then go further and identify um, um, what the indirect identifiers are, right? So we currently have, we complete step one, we currently have the identified data, um, but there's still information in the data which can uh, potentially be used to identify someone, um, right, or learn attributes about um, a specific se segment of the population. So we need to look um, for any indirect identifiers as well as sensitive information. Um, so if we remember a few um, slides ago what indirect identifiers are, um, we have some examples examples here on the screen. Um, so it's mostly demographic information about participants as well as information that would um, fall under 
um, a special category data on the GDPR. So this is, um, I think Maureen already listed a few. So this is ra uh, racial or ethnic origin, political opinions, religious or philosophical beliefs, um, or trade union membership, um, genetic data, biometric data, data concerning health, um, or data concerning a person's sex life or sexual orientation. Um, in addition, we need to think about any other information that is present in the data that might be of a sensitive nature, such as income or, or anything really um, that Maureen already mentioned um, already that might be considered sensitive, um, but doesn't necessarily fall under legal um, uh, concerns. <clears throat> Finally, um, just to mention here the, the importance of good metadata at this stage, so having good clear variable and value labels, um, both for data producers, uh, but also for archives um, or repositories um, when, uh, when they curate these data sets, right? So we have data sets that come in and they still have um, you know, that might potentially still have issues um, to address from an anonymization point of view before publication. So having good metadata is very important for us, um, you know, as archives to be able to, to carry out our ingest pro process and, um, and processing of that data before we can publish it. So that is, um, that's very important as well. Okay, and moving on to the next step. Um, so at this point, we're talking about really quantitative data only. Um, so once we have narrowed down our indirect identifiers, we need to we need to check frequencies. We need to look for small counts. Um, checking outliers is also part of the same process here. So just making sure that there are no um, no small counts in the data. So archives here will have their rules and guidance around this. Um, so around what threshold to use for these small counts, it might be, um, you know, uh, a count of five or a count of ten, or for example, HMRC um, count is, uh, threshold is 30, I believe. This is, um, this threshold can also depend on the access level. Um, uh, that the data will be available under. So um, really our recommendation here is to always liaise with the with the archive or the repository where you're planning to publish data. Um, we always encourage our um, depositors to, to get in touch with us about this um, so we can help and advise on um, on the threshold depending on on the access level that the data will be available under. Um, also important here is to look at string variables to ensure that they don't contain any problematic information, so meaning any personal information or any possible possibly litigious or commercially sensitive information that we would need to um, to to address before we can publish. Okay, <clears throat> so finally, step four. Uh, so once we have, we've identified what the uh, indirect identifiers are or any sensitive information in the data, um, what do we do about it? What are anonymization techniques? So Maureen already mentioned aggregation. So this is just to reduce precision from, for example, a very small village with um, maybe a few <laughs> hundreds of people, hundred people to a town or a city. Right. Um, we also have the option to recode categorical variables um, for, for indirect identifiers into fewer categories, and we're actually going to have an example of this on the next slide. Um, suppressing specific values of indirect identifiers for some units, so it, suppression is an, it's an SDC um, uh, method of addressing those small counts. Um, this is quite, <laughs> I wouldn't say advanced, but um, it, it wouldn't, uh, we, we don't necessarily have the time to go into this in, in a lot of detail. If you are interested in SDC, um, then there are, um, there are multiple sources of, of information out there if you want to read more about this. Um, but um, yeah, we, we can't go into so much detail about it. Um, generalizing the meaning of text variables, so replacing potentially disclosive, so free text responsive with more general text. We mentioned in the previous slide string variables, so this is um, this is, uh, yeah, so wherever we have those other, you know, open-ended um, answers in, in surveys, uh, we need to make sure that um, there is nothing there that is problematic. Restricting the upper or lower ranges of continuous um, variables to potentially, to high potential outliers. So age, it's a very good example here. Um, in the, on the screen, we have recorded recoding over 
into over 70, um, but this is of course depending on each uh, individual data set. Uh, we need to check um, frequencies to see um, to see how that recording would look like. So for example, if we only have two people who are um, over 70, who are say one is 74, one is 75, or two that are 74, um, then we would probably just recode that into 70 plus to hide, hide those outliers depending on that threshold um, that we discussed already. It's how to decide, yeah, checking frequencies for all indirect identifiers that we mentioned in the previous slide. Anonymizing georeference data, so uh, of course point coordinates can be problematic, especially for example if they point to someone's house, uh, so replacing this with non-disclosive non -disclosive variables, and this step would usually uh, you know, take us to having a pseudonymized or an anonymized data set. Of course there are different levels to pseudonymization and anonymization depending on the access level that we're going to publish that data under. Uh, but that is why we uh, advise you to, or advise data producers to get in touch with us, um, because depending on what uh, the access level will be, then we can um, pseudonymize more or less. Um, yeah, so we can advise on that. Okay. Um, as I mentioned, we have an example. Um, so in terms of recoding categorical variables, um, we have here on the screen, we have four variables. We have age, gender, profession, and ethnicity. Um, and just, just looking at it, um, there, <laughs> there are some obvious, there are obvious issues there. Um, for example, just looking at the age, we have one potential outlier there. Um, right, so what do we do in this case? Um, we can top code to hide potential outliers. As you, see, you can see, um, we've replaced 118 and 89 with uh, 80 plus, and we can also recode the ethnicity variable into, less, uh, into fewer categories. So there will be less precision, so less detail. Okay, so from Black Caribbean, that became just black, and from White Irish, that just became white, right? So um, less precision. And then I think this is back to you, Maureen, for this example. Yeah, so um, this is, uh, I think, a good example of, of thinking about the different levels of anonymization with qual data. So you start, you can see what the raw source looks like, the level of detail that's in there. Um, you know, in the greater context of an interview, this would be really important details to know. But then, of course, you have the issue of, well, if you're sharing the data or if you're trying to publish an extract, some of these details will be important, but you need to minimize the possibility of disclosure. So you might think about what level of anonymization is needed um, for the specific kind of output. So you might look to de-identify. So you take away those direct identifiers, such as the name. So we've changed the name in that example. Or you might need to think about um, the pseudonyms that you would use, you know, thinking about the next layer, do you need to reduce other kinds of disclosive details? For example, what date, specific date the, the chemotherapy treatment was on. So you could take out the specific day or you could even just do the year if needed. Um, and then you might think about an even more robust kind of anonymized if needed. So even taking out, uh, you know, the, the age, uh, specific age and putting in an age range um, or taking out um, the gender. Um, so when Anka and I were looking at this slide, we actually had a bit of a, a debate about, you know, uh, at what point do we take out, for example, uh, their identified gender? Um, at what point do we do we take out uh, the age and, and put in an age range? Um, so uh, different people might make slightly different decisions about what details to share and at what point. But I think it's a really good example of how you could think about the different levels of anonymization um, and how there may be something, uh, a, a, a kind of output where a higher level of anonymization is needed. Um, or you may be able to retain some of that information because it's really important. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Marie. 
Okay, so um, moving on. Um, so, so far we went through a few steps uh, that we can go about when, when trying to anonymize data, but there's also software that we can use um, to make our lives easier. So, um, we have a few options on the screen, um, including one that we have developed at the UK Data Service called QMI Data. Uh, this is an open source tool, so um, it, it is um, easily available online. Um, this produces a health check for numeric data, so it will um, use, of course, automated methods to detect and report in some of the most common problems that we have seen at the UK Data Archive when we receive numeric data such as missingness, duplication, outliers, and direct identifiers. So um, what, we've already, <laughs> what we've already looked at in, um, in previous slides. So um, there's also STC Micro, ARS, and NeuroArgus. Um, really, we don't necessarily <laughs> advise for one over the other. Um, it's, it's, it's your option if, if you'd like to use software to decide um, which one to use. Um, so yeah, SEC Micro is a very, very useful tool. Um, personally, I have used this, I use it, and it's very, very easy to use. It has a very friendly interface. Um, so no really uh, minimal coding skills needed. Um, and it's very useful um, when looking at anonymization. So yeah, just wanted to give you some options if this is something you'd, you'd consider. And I think this is back to you, Maureen. Yeah, so I mentioned earlier anonymization plans, and I can see already there's a, just a little bit of, of discussion about in the previous example of, of where, for example, to take out gender. At what point is that something that it might be a disclosive piece of information versus uh, you know, something that you can share. And I think uh, this all kind of points to, like I said earlier, the art of anonymization. Um, and so it's useful to kind of set up from the get-go what your plan for anonymization is. Um, uh, Gail or Anka, I think there's a, that worksheet, uh, not, sorry, not the worksheet, the handout of the anonymization plan. Just can one of you just um, quickly pop that into... Actually, Gail, I think it might be you because uh, Anka is Yeah, I'm sharing the slides. I can That's sorry. <laughs> yeah. So thank you, Gail. That's lovely. So um, you can see what uh, an example of an anonymization plan is. Gail's just popped the link into uh, the chat. Now, this is for Pioneers of Social Research, which I mentioned earlier is a kind of a unique collection because um, there was consent from participants to share their real names. Um, so, you know, you can see what, uh, what it, this example of uh, an anonymization plan that we devised before setting out to digi digitize and uh, prepare for um, dissemination, what, what our plan for anonymization was. Um, so you can see there, there's some broad categories. There's a bit of background about the project, how the data files are to be managed, what the potential direct identifiers, what are potential indirect identifiers, and what the procedure would be for changing those. Um, and I do like, like this example because it's one where participants have given their consent to share personal data. But nevertheless, we did still have to come up with a plan to review any areas that we thought could be deemed problematic or sensitive and what kind of approach we would use with that. So in this case, is we tended to do a little bit of redaction it was, you know, usually no more than a few lines, and it was just in a few places throughout the entire collection. So I think there was, I'm trying to remember now, was it 43 um, or um, life history interviews? It was only a few interviews that, that were actually affected by this. Um, we would have opted for slight editing over redaction if the situation allowed for that but the few places where we did have to do some editing to the transcript for purposes of anonymization kind of meant that, you know, they were sharing details that couldn't be shared. So we just, in this case, we did just have to redact, but it was a very light touch, only a few places. And it was always notated within the transcript with brackets that said, you know, this transcript has been edited to remove some details. Um, so hopefully this gives you a clear visual of what you might put together 
before actually carrying out your anonymization. So you have a clear idea of what choices you do want to make. So for example, I could see in the discussion people just uh, talking about the gender, redaction of gender. Perhaps you feel that that is actually really, really important to the value of the data. And so you would need to ensure that if you feel that is a disclosive detail, what is the plan? Are you, are, is there another way of indicating uh, what you need to convey about the data? Or do you keep that in and ensure that there are other details that are anonymized more um, that when used with gender could be disclosive? So do you, do you look for other indirect identifiers and ensure that those are the ones that you either use pseudonyms for or if you need to edit slightly to, to do that? Um, so it just gives you an idea of how you can set that plan out so you have a consistent approach across your data sets. All right, and on the next slide, I've got um, the, the sort of summary, hopefully, of what, what you can gather from what we've talked about so far, which is to take what we call like a three-prong approach to protect, protecting participants. So to think about consent and access in conjunction with anonymization. So if you are planning on sharing the data and whether that is sharing uh, excerpts within publications or to actually share the data sets itself, and I know a lot of publishers now uh, uh, are requiring researchers to share data sets before publication. Um, so make sure you are asking for consent to share the data. So researchers must inform their participants about the risks and the benefits of, of data sharing, and they must think about any uh, obligations that they have uh, to either have audits run on the data or um, if they're going to publish to, to uh, any obligations to share there. Um, try to anonymize only um, if the dam damage to the data is minimal. Um, so this includes really thinking hard about, for example, audio clips or images or video. I know somebody in the Q&A has asked specifically um, about the audio. Those can be very difficult to uh, anonymize simply because there's so much damage to the data that's done. Um, so really thinking about what is your strategy then to ensure participants are protected. Um, and then to think about regulating the access. So if you archive the data with a trusted repository like the UK Data Archive, there is an end user agreement in place and there are options like embargo or uh, to ask for permission from the data depositor in order to access the data. So using all three of those strategies will enable you to share most data, perhaps there are, there are some, some very select ones where there is a high risk to participants, but um, you know, most data can be shared if you have consent and access in place alongside anonymization. So um, yeah, I think it's back to you, Anka, now. Um, and we just, I think we did reached pretty much the, the end of the, the slides and now we just have a few, um, a few tools and uh, sort of resources to, to mention to you. So on this slide we have tools and templates, so uh, we have um, several templates on our website that you can just download and, and adapt to your project, such as a model consent form, um, survey consent statement, transcription template, um, and so on, a data list template um, that is a type of documentation that is uploaded with quali uh, qualitative data. So do have a look at these um, <clears throat> in your own time. Further resources, as I mentioned, if you're interested in reading more about um, maybe aspects that we, we didn't have time to cover um, in, in, in today's session, um, there's some uh, resources for you. Um, of course, get in touch if you have any, any questions. We also have a, a YouTube channel where you can uh, see recordings of past um, workshops and um, you can you can tweet us um, and you can um, yeah visit our website 
And of course, the slides will be available on our website um, as well. Um, upcoming events, so we are running, um, we have recurring workshops um, every spring and every autumn. Um, I think they mostly run. <laughs> so we, uh, yeah, and some of the topics are on the screen. If it's, if there's something that you're interested in, uh, we linked here at the bottom, the events page, we could, where you could um, learn more information and also register for these workshops. And now we've reached the exercise. Um, so we, we have a quick menti exercise. Um, it's, it's, um, don't worry, it is anonymous and we're not trying to, to, to test you really in any way. It's just to um, really start a conversation around some of the, the topics we've already looked at today um, and, and add to those. Um, and it's usually, it, this ends up really just being a, a really interesting um, conversation uh, for the next 10 minutes or so. Okay, so the first question, um, just really for us to have an idea of what um, types of data you are working um, with. Um, so what type of data are you looking to anonymize um, or you've collected in your current project? Um, is it quantitative, qualitative, both? Or maybe it's too early on and you're not sure. Um, just uh, really fine. Uh, I see we have a hundred and Okay, over 100 people now, so that's great. Um, so I see the most um, mo most popular answer is both, um, so that's great. Although uh, I see the qualitative is significant, oh, well, <laughs> higher than the quantitative um, box. So, <clears throat> but yeah, that's good. Thank you very much. Uh, it's just good for us to have an idea. Um, so this is really just for you to submit uh, your response in. So what information would you think about when talking about anonymizing data? Okay, how to manage gender and ethnicity. Okay, personal information. That's very good. Names, I see names. Who am I talking to? Ensuring participant safety. Right, that's a that's it. <laughs> that is very important. I'm so glad someone put that there. Um, okay, risk identification. Yeah, organizations. Yeah, it's very well. So we're not just talking about um, individuals. Um, personal information. Personal information. Um, data uses and data sharing. I saw that. Uh, it's very good. Um, Workplaces, yeah. Uh, reassuring participants, yes, that is very, very important. Um, data protection impact assessments, yeah. DPIAs, that's that's, that's very good. Um, what has been consented to, yeah, very good. Um, company information, right? Uh, these are these are great. <laughs> I think, I think, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, we were we weren't expecting this much detail, but this is this is great. Um, okay, so I'm just going to move on to the next. Thank you very much. Um, this all looks very good. Um, yeah, consent aggregation, no identifying individuals. Yeah, how data can be used when out when public. Yeah, protective cards. All right, very good. Thank you very much, everyone. That's uh, very good. Okay, um, thinking about direct identifiers, so we have um, we have touched on this in the presentation. We had examples, and I see names. The first example, uh, yes, names. That is great. Thank you very much. Um, IP addresses, yes. Um, Gender is not a direct identifier. Gender is an indirect identifier. Um, um, but uh, yeah, social security number. I see. I see quite a few, um, quite a few mentions on the screen of things that are not direct. So age, age is uh, is not a direct identifier. Um, you know, there's so many other people out there with the same age as me that is not <laughs> pointing to me. Um, bank details. Yes, that is uh, that is a good example. Um, Okay, uh, religion, that is not a direct identifier, um, but they're, yes, most of, the, <laughs> most of the ones I see on the screen, they're very good. Email address, yeah, uh, home address, it's very good, um, yeah, address, 
national insurance number, NHS number, yeah, insurance number. Very good, yeah. Um, Thank you very much. And I think the next example would be indirect identifiers. So very good examples on the screen. Um, so we have gender, age, occupation, uh, religion, um, um, race, geography, place of work, um, date of birth, yes, um, employer. Yes, these are very good examples. Um, job role. Uh, yeah, okay, this is this is great. Thank you. Um, okay, now some more uh, specific questions, if you will. So which is the most disclosive? We have IP address, postcode, gender, and religious belief. <clears throat> Okay, so um, by most disclosive here, I, I think um, what we were really just aiming for was what are the direct identifiers really. And this, in this example, that would be IP address and um, both as well as postcode, right? Because that is that can be quite um, narrowing down, especially the full postcode um, in terms of identification. So um, yeah, I see the most popular answer is IP address. Um, so that's great followed by postcode. So, um, yeah, that's very good. Thank you. Let's move on. Is someone jobs titled personal information? <clears throat> so a direct identifier, right? This is a yes or an yes, yes, no answer. Um, I see the most popular answer is no. Um, and this is this is not a trick question, but it's a it's an interesting um, it's just an interesting thing to think about. Um, if someone's job title can be pointing to an individual, and I th the answer here is that it depends, right? It depends on um, is someone else out there with the same job title? And I, I think we we actually came on to this because I, I had a colleague at some point who um, who googled their um, their job title. And it actually Google, you know, spit out um, their name. So in that situation, um, that would be considered personal information, right? So again, thinking about context and um, everything else we know about um, about someone or about a unit of observation, um, yeah, putting it in context um, can tell us if it's if it's personal information or not. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> Select direct identifiers. So we have job title, we have email address, we have gender, age, party affiliation, and national insurance number. Okay, so I see the most the, the two most popular answers were email address and national insurance number. Um, we also have quite a few of you who selected job title, probably because of the previous question. Um, that's very good. Um, so yeah, we were going for email address and national insurance number. Of course, yes, job title can potentially be um, depending on context, um, but for this specific example, the, the clear direct identifiers are email address and national insurance number. Okay, thank you. Select indirect identifiers. Um, and we have geog geographic coordinates, date of birth, gender, supermarket preference, sexual preference, ethnic background. There's a bit of debate as well going on in the chat about these, which I think just reinforces how yeah. anonymization can be a bit of an art form in terms of, you know, I think when we when we select these answers, um, uh, we're doing so from our perspective as archivists of, you know, looking generally across, but there's always going to be like an exception to the rule, isn't there? Mm -hmm. So it's important yeah, to definitely. take your whole project into account, but generally speaking, you yeah. know. Yeah. Um, okay, thank you. I see um, most popular answers were ethnic background and gender. 
So um, really what we were going for is, um, well, the ones that, <laughs> so date of birth, gender, sexual preference, and ethnic background. And I'll explain uh, why the other two were, were not selected here. So geographic coordinates, those would actually be a direct identifier, especially if, so we have um, latitude and longitude of someone's house, for example. Um, so that wouldn't be an indirect identifier. Um, and then supermarket preference, that is not necessarily considered something uh, that could, you know, whether I prefer one supermarket over the other I don't think that is something that would could help identify me or piece together who I am um, these usually these sort of um, I don't know what, what they're called lifestyle choices preferences lifestyle preferences uh, are not considered to be in our experience but again it depends on the context again um, yeah as Maureen pointed out I'm sure there's some conversation in the Q&A uh, that for Perhaps for some projects, that might be something that you consider to be um, an identifier, uh, in which case, yeah, that's fine. But what we, what we have seen in our experience, uh, that supermarket preference is not necessarily something that um, we have pointed to as an indirect identifier. Okay. <clears throat> the identification is redacting direct identifiers. Okay, so we have seen this in the slides. Is this enough to consider the data anonymized? Okay, yeah, the correct answer here was no. So the identification just takes out the personal information, but there's still quite a, quite a lot of um, details in there. Um, so indirect identifiers, sensitive information um, that um, is still um, is still um, present in the data. So no, that would not uh, make the data anonymized. Okay, moving on. Um, and I think this is you taking over, Maureen. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> data collected on a sensitive topic is always sensitive data. True or false? or false most of you are saying false some of you not sure a few of you true okay and and the answer is um I, I would say the answer is false um so I talked about that managing life at um sorry uh managing suffering at the end of life uh, collection where it was sensitive data because they're talking about medical condition but when we talk about sensitive data it is, it is a very specific kind of list within law, but that doesn't mean that it, your data may not be on a sensitive topic. So I think it's important to distinguish data from topic. And, and it, I think it, it kind of um, will clarify for you what some of your legal obligations may be to anonymize versus what some of your ethical um, decisions may be for anonymization, okay? Um, next one, another true or false, it is good practice to annotate anonymization in qualitative research. So for example, with square brackets or an anonymization log. And thank goodness all of you are answering true. Excellent. Yeah, you definitely, if you are depositing your data somewhere for others to um, reuse or to see, um, it's really important that you have annotated wherever you have kind of either edited or anonymized certain details. Um, it's, it's, you know, although uh, anonymization may lead to information loss, if you at least kind of point to where information has been lost, it helps contextualize some of that. So it's a really important thing uh, to annotate. Excellent. Um, which of the following strategies can be used to protect participants' identities? Tick all that apply. So this is a multiple. And we've got gaining informed consent, controlling access to the data, anonymizing the data as soon as possible. And we've got most of you have said anonymizing and controlling access with a few more of you adding in the consent to that. 
Okay, so um, the answer to this one, Anka, if you just want to. I don't think we have an automated one for this one. For some reason, it doesn't say presenter to show results. But oh, I think no. we were going well, for all three. <laughs> all right. The answer is all three. So um, I know some of you have not ticked off con informed consent. Just to say consent, regardless of anonymization, consent to collect data on people, particularly if it's uh, personal data of any kind, um, you do need consent. It's a legal obligation. So you have to have consent. But when you when you get the consent, it's really important to design your consent form so that you're thinking about all of the places where you might share data or bits of data um, and what kind of formats those would take so that your participants are fully informed. So you should tick off all three, definitely. Um, and then once the data has been collected, you can also control access to the data and work on, work through your anonymization strategies. So, um, and what would be one of the first things you do when anonymizing data? I think this is back to you, Anka, isn't it? Thinking yep. about the steps uh, of anonymization. <laughs> Um, so assessing the audience, so thinking about in advance who is going to see it, am I going to share it with someone, am I going to share the data at the end of the project, um, identifying my role, um, you know, as data owner, as data controller, um, Am I going to also share the data? Am I going to be the person who's going to prepare that, etc.? cetera? Um, consider access control options. Um, identifying a direct identifiers and begin changing or redacting or mapping the data. So identifying what is personal data, sensitive data, etc. Okay, so I see the most popular answer is mapping the data, identifying what is personal data, sensitive data, and so on. Um, um, also identifying my role, so being aware of the fact that I'm probably uh, going to be a data controller as the person who's collecting it, um, and, you know, um, having responsibilities very clear in terms of, especially if we have for example, a data management plan where we list the responsibilities. Um, you know, am I going to be the person who deposits the data, the person who anonymizes the data, who translates the data, etc. Okay. Um, okay. So thank you. I see the most popular answer was map the data. So that's if there are any if there are any further questions, we did include our email in the slides, which we didn't finish. Actually, that was the last slide that we didn't go through um, but our emails are um, are attached there so if if there's any questions that we didn't get to or any clarifications you'd like to um, to go through um, please do email us and we're happy to to have a chat um, but yeah I think I think we can say thank you very much for joining uh, and we hope this session was was useful um, and yeah I'll see you in in another in another workshop in the future hopefully thank you everyone thank Bye. you <clears throat>